Well, good morning. That's all I got? Oh, yeah, you can't sing with your mask, but you can say good morning, I'm pretty sure. All right, thank you. That's a whole lot better. Uh, what an awesome gift to be able to come again and to speak and to bring God's Word this morning. Uh, what a blessing for my first week. Um, it was full, so I, um, I got to write a message for Sunday. I got to do a, funeral, or a wedding sermon and a funeral sermon. I, I have a funeral to do after this service, so it's been a nice full week. Oh, and on top of it, there was this storm. I don't know if you'd heard about it at all. And I don't want to brag, but we live in Heartland, so they restored our power first. So if you're without, I'm sorry. They like us better up there. Um, <clears throat> it's actually amazing, this little podunk town, and right on Route 20, there's, there's some benefits to living right on a main road, because you get your power and utilities back, you know, because after all, they got to get it to the restaurant. I think that's what it was. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, we're going to be looking at this passage in Matthew today, and uh, the title I picked for this is The Faith and the One Who Calls. It's so easy to read this passage and to, um, to hear this passage and to be awed by the miracle of Jesus walking on the water, and, and rightfully so. Um, but there is, there's more that's going on in, in this, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but before we begin, let's, let's just start with a word of prayer. Father God, I ask that you, would, uh, that you would speak to us this morning by the power of your word. That you, would, uh, that you would clear away all of the anxieties, the frustrations, the, the wonders that, of, that this week has brought, this week past, that you would still our hearts before you, that your word would do its work in our heart. Lord, we're thankful that we have it, that you've given it to us, that you can speak to us and we can know and hear your voice and be stilled. And so, Father, still us now as we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So this past summer, while I was uh, on sabbatical, this, this two months off, which was fantastic, uh, one of the things that I got to do was introduce my, my oldest kids to mountain biking. Um, and so years and years ago, I used to ride mountain bikes all the time. I even raced for a season. And uh, just I, I was always on my bike. I, I loved riding. And it was cool to bring my kids into the woods. And now one of the things I loved about mountain biking was going fast. Uh, going fast in the woods is what it was all about. And you kind of have to do that if you're going to race, right? Yes, you have to be fast if you want to race. Um, so anyway, um, it's fun to learn how to be fast, and part of being fast isn't just pedaling and going fast, it's, it's knowing how to read terrain, it's knowing how to pick the best line in the woods, it's knowing about when to shift, as weird as that sounds, and you know, to, to anticipate your shifts, to know when you're going to have to shift your bike. It's about using your body, there's science involved, there's balance, there's all these other things that go into going fast, and so I'm trying to teach my kids uh, what I enjoy and going fast, and so I'm trying to teach them as well to go fast. And so um, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is learning to trust uh, yourself as a rider and understanding uh, the skill, uh, understanding what you're doing, understanding how you're using your body, to trust the bike uh, that it's going to perform the way it's supposed to, um, and then also to trust science a bit, that science will actually do, that'll help you out in, in certain areas. So um, now as the kids are learning this, it's hard for them to understand uh, because much of it's counterintuitive to an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, so for example, I'm constantly having to tell my kids, speed is your friend. So speed, momentum, is your friend in the woods. It's actually helpful for balance. It's helpful to get over obstacles. It's helpful in a whole bunch of different ways. Speed is your friend. And so my daughter, she's sitting outside now and probably, because you know how many times I have to tell her, she's so cognitive when she rides. And like, maybe like everybody, but even still, I have to tell her all the time, speed is your friend. You just have to trust me. Um, now, uh, it can help you, again, to keep your balance, to, to get over obstacles, uh, but going from uh, the prospect of going fast on the bike, it, it seems that it's more dangerous to have speed as your friend. It seems way more dangerous, particularly in a couple of areas. Like, so on downhills, again, it's counterintuitive. On a downhill, you want speed, especially if there's loose rock. You want speed because if you go slow over loose stone, Every stone your bike can react to, whereas if you're going fast, you're kind of skipping over the top of the stones, and you can keep your line. It, it, it sounds really silly, but that's true. And so like to get momentum going down a hill, the last thing you want to do is stop because your weight is shifted. And so I'm um, telling my kids, go fast and down a hill, they're, you know, when they get up to the top of the hill and they're looking down it, they just they stop. Or one of my other personal favorites is when, when they, uh, they get to the top of the hill, they'll start to go down, they'll get a little bit of, of uh, 
of strength or, or confidence, and, and then they take their, foot, their feet off the pedals. So if I could do this for you, it, it's going to be a feat of, of, but like th- both of them like this, right? So they're just sitting on the seat, not understanding that that doesn't help anything. You're, yeah, your butt's on the seat until the next rock hits you and, j- and makes you go this way or that way. So like they'll go riding down the hill with their feet out, and I'm like, no. No, stay. It's actually better for you. So anyway, I'm trying to tell my kids all of these things about what it means to go fast and to be under control in the woods. The most frustrating part about it is that my kids just won't listen to me. Anybody know what that's like? Um, they won't listen to me. So I'm their dad, and I, I'd like to think by now they, they would realize that I'm not going to put them in a dangerous position or I'm not going to bring them somewhere uh, on a trail that they can't handle I'm not going to bring them to something that they cannot do. Uh, and so I'll encourage them to go faster down the hill because I know they can, they can handle it. Their bikes can handle it. Their equipment, everything, they can handle what I'm bringing them on. But they just can't take my word for it. No, just go down the hill. You know how many times I've been standing like, just come this way. Do you see that? Like, and I'm pointing it out to them and I'll draw it with a stick. You know, just, just dr- run back up the hill and kind of go with a stick. You know, follow this line down and you'll be fine. And they just, they can't listen to me. They can't listen to me. Now, um, this, is, this is kind of us, isn't it? It's not just my six-year-old and my eight-year-old. This is us, isn't it? That we, we, we struggle to trust somebody with something that doesn't seem right. We struggle to trust. Um, and so this, for my kids, um, is, is just normal, really. Um, because what we've started to realize, what you trust is something that you know or that you can do yourself. Those are the things that we trust, right? We trust things by our experience. We learn to trust something. And oddly enough, you know, we can do these experiments where I can take a stool and I can, I can say, this thing's going to hold me and I can sit down because my life experience says that I can just do this, which I probably should have just used this before. But I, I know from life's experience, I can trust this thing. I've learned it. Now, notice who's doing the verbs. I have learned it. Now, uh, if, I were, if somebody were to play a trick on me and just kind of like take all the, all the fasteners and glue and everything out of this and just kind of leave it there as a pile of sticks and I sat down on it, it would be harder for me the next time to trust the stool, wouldn't it? Because gravity would win. So like trust is a thing that if we look at it, it's, it's a thing that we think that we are doing. We think that we are doing, we are the ones building our trust. So for example, I'm sure you've heard sayings about this. Uh, there's this old, this old saying that trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. You ever heard that? And in relationships, that's, that's absolutely true. But it's true because we have to learn to do it again. It's something that we are doing. And so we often talk about learning to trust someone as an action that we carry on. Um, but in Scripture, and in this passage, you know, it's, it's not that. Do you realize that in the pages of Scripture that trust is not that? It's not about a thing that we learn. It's not about a thing that we are doing at all. Do you realize that? And hopefully you'll see this as the gift that it is. In this passage in Matthew, we read the account of Peter walking on water during a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And this, ca- this account Again, it takes place right after he, Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people, actually more than 5,000 people. Uh, the, the thought is it was 5,000 men, not including their, their, the women and children that were there as well. So he fed this, this multitude of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He did this incredible miracle. And he shows himself to be above nature, to be bigger than his circumstances, he shows himself to be more than just a mere man. Now, after Jesus dismisses the crowds, though, he sends the disciples away in a boat, and then he went up on a mountaintop to pray. And while he was praying, the storm rose up, and the disciples were caught in it on the Sea of Galilee. Remember, they're fishermen. They know this stuff. They know the water. They understand what a storm is like. They've been through them before. But in verse 14, it gives a description of actually what this storm looked like. And it says that it was beaten, or the, the boat was beaten by the waves and the wind was against them. So like we hear about this storm and we think, well, okay, well, what does it look like? And maybe for you and I that, uh, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on the water. So, uh, you know, if, if, you know, whatever might make me afraid probably wouldn't make somebody who is, you know, lives as a fisherman, works as a fisherman, they, they wouldn't care about it at all, right? 
So, uh, the, you know, there's a little bit of, you got to realize, these guys were familiar with the water, and so this had to be a storm of note in order for it to be written down, that this was actually something big. But also, so that you can get a picture of this, um, notice that they were facing, it says that they were facing it into a headwind, and so uh, I'm, no, I'm no sailing expert, but it doesn't seem like you can sail into the wind. I know there's ways to use the wind and go in like a, a weird direction, but, you, but I know you cannot sail into a strong headwind. It just pushes you back where they go, which means these fishermen were rowing. Those old fishing boats, they had, they had oars, and they were, they were rowing to get where they needed to go. And so imagine the difficulty of rowing the boat into a strong headwind while being battered by waves, all right? So we're getting a little bit of a picture here. And not to mention that this storm rose up, it said, in the evening hours. It rose up in the evening hours and was continuing to rage until what it says is the fourth watch of the night. In ancient timekeeping, the fourth watch of night was probably between, was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So from evening the night before until between 3 and 6 in the morning, they were fighting this storm, rowing against this storm, struggling against this storm, being battered. Now, I think you maybe need to realize that this is maybe six or more potentially hours that they were at it. Now, to put this in perspective, it might just give you a, a, just a small picture of how exhausted they were, how tired they were, how exasperated they were, when the next events come. In their, in their exhaustion, at this point, it says that he came to them, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. In the midst of their exhaustion, at the end of their effort, he comes to them walking on the sea. So again, it's easy to look at this, this, this passage and say, Jesus walked on the water and it's a miracle. But we also have to look at when and why he came out and walked on the water, and that's somehow even more miraculous. So his, his being able simply to walk on the water shows again, as he did with the feeding of the 5,000, that he has power over nature. He is not just any man. He just, he shows up. But what's even bigger than this is that when we read in, in Mark's gospel, the, the parallel account in here, it says in chapter 6, 48, uh, verse 48, when he saw they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. Uh, I'm sorry, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Just stop for a moment. He saw what they were going through. He witnessed what they were doing. He witnessed their exhaustion, their struggle. He witnessed, he saw it all, and he came to them. They had no idea he was looking. They had no idea he was paying attention. He came to them. What an incredible thought to know that this Jesus knows. He knows. And not only that, but he came. He comes to them. So as Christ shows up to the disciples that night, verse 26 says that they were terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost now, if you were exhausted and exasperated and fighting the wind and the waves, and all of a sudden there's, a, there's somebody walking on the water, I suppose you would do the same. Now, the Greek word, it's actually really funny uh, for me to think about, you know, because you hear about Peter, and he's just like this, you know, his name means he's the rock, you know, tough guy. Um, it says that they shrieked. Um, there was one time I was putting insulation in a crawl space in my basement, and I, I, was, I was sitting, and you know, I had just enough space to sit and grabbing bats of, of insulation and kind of stuffing it up in, in, where, the, where the sill is on the outside of the wall. I was sitting kind of close to it like this, and I was wearing a dust mask, and so I grab a piece of insulation, I'm going to put it in the next bay, and there's a mouse right there, and, it, and, it, and its little beady eyes were just looking at me, and, and I couldn't help it. I, I went something like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, I got really sheepish. I couldn't control it. I got really sheepish, and I went upstairs and kind of like, hey, did, did you hear anything downstairs? <laughs> Beth was like, no, no, why? Hmm, no reason. I went back downstairs and did it. So I, I imagine 
that, that Peter, there was some sort of shriek like that, like, eek, you know, enough to actually be scared enough to act in front of all of his friends to do something like that. And where Peter, may, I kind of wonder almost like my, my weird twisted sense of humor wonders if like a record skipped and everybody just looked at Peter or whoever shrieked and was like, what? What just happened? But anyway, the idea was he was scared and it came out, it, it came out vocally. He was, he was frightened. He was frightened. And, but Jesus, again, he realizes there, he knows everything about it. He knows they're afraid, whatever. And so he, notice what happens next. Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, don't be afraid. I, everything that's going on, he thinks he sees a ghost. Take heart, it is I, you know, don't be afraid. Now, when I try that with my kids, just with mountain biking, don't worry about it. Follow this line, just don't be afraid. It never quells any of their fears. But in this, in the midst of their fear, Jesus speaks and he comforts them with his presence, so much so that Peter, in the midst of a raging storm, exhausted from rowing, makes a peculiar statement. He says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, is anybody else baffled by that? Right, because I know a couple things, you know, like in the midst of a storm to get out of a boat and go into the storm, it doesn't seem right to me because after all, the reason that people don't want to be in a storm is because if the boat overturns, you're in the water. And so you're doing everything that you can do to stay in the boat, not in the water, right? But he says, tell me and I'll come out of the boat into the water. Now, I can't help but wondering wonder if there was a sense where Peter saw calm around Christ. I don't know what the picture looks like. It doesn't give us details, but I can't help but to see that Peter saw that something was better with where Jesus was than where he currently was. And that doesn't make sense to me. Because in a storm, I would think, I'm going to stay in the boat. Would you? Probably if you're reasonable, yes. Yes. But something tells me that he saw something. There was some kind of peace. There was some kind of calm. For, there was some kind of calm in order for him to want to get out of that boat. So why would he want to get out of the boat? This author, R.C.H. Lenski, he writes, Convinced that Jesus actually walked on the water, he thought sud- the thought suddenly flashed into his mind that with Jesus' consent, he too could do so. That somewhere in the moment, he thought the calm, whatever, the, whatever he saw in Christ, he realized, I, I could be there too. He, he would allow me to be there too. And in this, we see, we see a glimmer of faith that comes from Peter. But in response, listen, it was in response because Jesus' first words to them, remember, don't be afraid, it is I. Now, if it was a ghost you know, and it was inviting you to come out onto the water, I think it would be really, really different. But he recognized it was Jesus and that he could trust him. So notice, Peter just doesn't jump into the water either. He sees Jesus and, and he recognizes that he's walking on the water and he, and he says, if it's you, just confirming that it is, I believe it's you, but just confirm it and invite me out. But he, he Peter doesn't just still, he doesn't just jump in the water. Now we know a, we know Peter's uh, attitude, what he's like. You can read that in Scripture. He's bold, he's brash, he speaks. You know, he, he's the guy that goes out and, you know, draws the sword and he's ready to fight. Um, he, he's a tough guy. And in all of his capabilities, everything that he's able to do, he won't get out of the boat until he's invited. He doesn't just jump in the water. He's not willing to do anything unless Jesus, the one who appears, the one who speaks calm, calls. Because at that moment, again, he's seeing Jesus maybe as the one who is not subject to the storm or maybe even is over the storm and trust not himself, but trust that Jesus would allow him to not perish by getting out of the boat. Seeing Jesus walking calmly amid the storm is what Peter needs to exit the boat. And only because Jesus bids him to come does Peter get out of the boat and even walk on the water for a couple steps because Jesus invites him to come. It's by Jesus' word alone that he is able to go. 
Again, this makes no sense to my human brain. Again, with my kids, even though they can't trust me, to, that I can tell them, hey, you can handle this. Or if we put this in the context of a lot of things, you know, my fears of, of being, do you know how scary it was for me to walk in that office and see senior pastor? I've been an associate pastor for 13 years, so like it was nice, you know, Roger, Roger can handle all that stuff, and I'll just hide, kind of hide behind Roger, you know, like, so it, it's scary to be the guy that's out front, you know, and, and it, 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 it's fearful, and people will tell me, hey, don't be afraid. Well, okay, you know, it doesn't work, and I'm sure you get that with a lot of things, with your anxieties. People tell you, don't be afraid, but you can't help but to be afraid. You can't help but to worry. It's just the way we are. We, we, we have a hard time trusting Maybe because we have the wrong object of our trust. We're looking too much at our own weaknesses and the things that we can't handle, and we don't look enough at God who is able to cast out all of our fear and make us and allow us to trust. It comes from God. This gift of faith comes from the one who is able to do all things. Instead, what we do is we find our, our ways looking for experience that we can, in fact, handle this thing that God is putting before us. You know, imagine what this story would look like if David and Goliath, when David went out to fight Goliath, imagine what this would have looked like if he didn't know that God was in his corner. Imagine how, what the comedy of errors this could have been. No, the armor, I, I can't, I can't, the armor doesn't fit. No, I can't, I don't have a machine gun. You know, like he, imagine all the excuses that would have come up. But because he trusted, he was able to go. So when we stop looking for experiences, when we stop looking for the things that we can handle, only then do we really speak of true faith as understanding that it's a gift that God gives to us. If we speak of faith as something that we are doing, it is very disastrous. It's disastrous. And unfortunately, I get caught in that trap, and maybe you do too. Uh, when it comes to living a life for Christ, we get caught in that trap that I don't have enough strength to do it. My faith is wandering. You ever, you ever been so discouraged because you can't do something or, or sin keeps cropping up in your life over and over and over and there's certain things that you just can't put it away and what you end up doing is you say, oh, I can't live, the, I can't live this Christian life and then you end up actually either running more toward Christ saying, I can't handle this, I need you. But realistically, what happens to me is I say, I can't do this. I stink at this. I'm not even going to try anymore. Anybody ever been there? It's awful. It's an awful place to be, but we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at our own energy. We're, we're looking at our own ability to trust. We're looking at our own faith as if it's something from us. Dr. Tim Istabo, one of my seminary professors, he says, faith is always created by the object of faith. Faith is always created by the object of faith. Faith is created by the one who is almighty and powerful and can endure and withstand all things. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's God who gives us that faith. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ that speaks to us. Faith comes from him, the object of our faith, our king. So my own abilities, if I, if I rely on them as my, my uh, foundation for faith, I will fail. We will fail. But if we can look at the one who calls us by his word and supplies all that we need, we can have confidence because he will do it. Notice that this is what happened to Peter. He started, he's walking on the water, but, you know, at some point he gets, he starts to be overwhelmed by his circumstances, and he does what you and I do, and we start to, oh, I can't handle this, and we start to go another way. This is what he does. He's walking on the water at Christ's command because he bid him to come to me. And so in verse 30, though, it says that when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. At, at one point, he was walking on the water toward Christ, the one who invited him, the one who was able to sustain him and carry him. At his word, he got out of the boat. But in his circumstance, he stopped and he looked around. And he realized, I can't handle what's going on right now, not realizing that I was just walking on water because Jesus had bid me to come. 
He started to look at his own strength. And he begins to sink. In other words, Peter's ability to walk on the water, it had nothing to do with his own gifts, his own abilities, his own experience. None of it was able to make him walk on water. It was simply by Christ alone. Even though Peter makes this great leap of faith to get out of the boat, he hasn't mastered this walk in faith. He hasn't mastered it by any means. And, you know, the last couple, we've heard sermons from, uh, from Steve and from Pastor Warren on sanctification, this work that God is doing in us, making us more like Christ. You know, we're not completely like Christ yet. And so in faith, he will sanctify us. He will grow us in this. This is work, again, that he will do if we can look at him and not our own strength and ability. Now, what we look at, we see even one, one more time in this whole scene, Peter gets out of the boat and he's sinking. And he cries out, Lord, save me. I want you to just get a picture here. Like, so there, there, is, there is that glimpse or that little glimmer of the invitation of, of Jesus that said to come. And the, maybe the picture, I can imagine him going under and see, just watching Jesus' feet on top of the water. And he's sinking below. And seeing that Jesus isn't affected. So he cries out, Lord, save me, remembering again who is able to walk on the water. And so Jesus, or Peter cries out, Lord, save me. When his abilities come to an end and he has nowhere else to go, he cries out to Jesus alone. In his helpless cry, in verse 31, it says, Jesus, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In recognizing Peter's own weakness and failures, he calls to the one alone that can save him, and it's Christ alone. Notice something very important. Peter's little faith, and Jesus says it, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? His little faith saved him. Peter's little faith, not this big grand faith that he could move mountains, his little faith in seeing Jesus as the answer and crying out to him, that is what saved him. Nothing that he could do on his own, none of his own works, none of his own boasting, nothing can save him. Nothing. Except for Christ. Now, this is our story. This is our story. You know, maybe you haven't been on, on, a, on a sea, the Sea of Galilee, or in Highland Lake, or wherever you might be, walking on water. Maybe you haven't been there, or maybe you haven't been drowning, or whatever. But this is our story of, of faith. This is our story, our life. When it comes in regard to our sin, this is us. We are, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. That's what the Word says. We are dead. And there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Not a thing. Our, our righteousness by our works is not enough. Our serving at church and being part of boards and volunteering here and there, it's not enough. Our being nice to our neighbor, being kind, doing all these other things, that's not enough. It doesn't save us. None of it will save us. None of it. And we're sinking. Yet Christ calls us by his word. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come. Come. And so we come with him, to him knowing that we aren't able to save ourselves and at his invitation to simply believe that he is the one who is able is what calms the storm and saves us from death. When we can look at Jesus and we can look at the, the understand what happened at the cross, that he died for our sin, that he took the penalty for us, the thing that we could not fix, he fixed it and he bids us to come. And he bids us to come because he's not in the storm, he's above it. He's seated on his throne in glory at the right hand of God the Father. And from there he says, come, I've made a way, come. And we can come. We can come into his presence. We can simply believe. Has anybody ever wondered what your conversation is going to be like when you actually get into glory? I wonder this all the time. I wonder that I, I hope that I never get it wrong. I know that my faith is in Christ alone, and, and, and I actually find myself at times rehearsing. <laughs> when, when God says to, to me, well, um, when he reads all of my charges, because I believe there's going to be the account of all the good, I have to give an account to him of all the, thing, the things that I've done in my life, good or bad, I'm going to give him an account. And when he reads it all and I'm embarrassed by it and I stand in front of him like in shame, What's my only plea? 
Jesus said. He said, come. He said, come. He forgave me of all of my weaknesses. He's forgiven me. Try as I might to be holy afterwards, and, and, and I, I'm trying to be sanctified by him. No, I'm not. I'm allowing him to sanctify me and show me what's right and show me what's good. But my plea is going to be, he, bid, he bids me to come. Jesus allowed me to come. He allows you to come. And that's where we find our freedom. When we see, like Peter, that he was above the storm and he was walking, and we, like, uh, like R.C.H. R. C. H. Lenski said, when we realize that if he rose again from the dead and is bidding us to come, then we could too. In Christ, we will too. And that's the thing that gives us the confidence and faith because Jesus has done it. And that's where we get to sit. And that's where we find salvation. I don't know what your week was like. I don't know what your week was like. I don't know what your month has been like or the last couple months have been like for you. I don't know how discouraged you are. I don't know how many times you've been, um, you've been struggling in, in your faith and what it is that you're doing. And I want you to hear this. Faith is a gift that God gives you. And even a little faith is what saves you. Rest in it that Jesus has accomplished it, that he invites you. He comes to you. He wants you to be with him where he is, and he will do that work. Now, last point here. This frees us up. Jesus has bid me to come. And you know what? Um, all the things that I think that I can't do, that I want to do now, like I want to live my life and be holy and pleasing to God. I don't have to. It doesn't earn my salvation, but I want to. I want to show the world around me what Christ is like by being like Christ to them, to be holy and pleasing. I want to do those things. I, don't, I won't always do them perfectly, but I still want to. The Word shows me what I should do, and He is even with me in that, and He will help us to do that. He will sanctify us in that. He will make us like Himself. So not only does He save us, but He likes us, <laughs> and He wants to work in us and make us more like Him. He wants to do that in us. What an incredible freedom we have in this gospel message that you and I can rest in that. Isn't that good news? So maybe you were burdened by what you're not able to do this week, and I hope you're able to take that burden and throw it at the foot of the cross, knowing that Jesus rose again, he, he, has, he has life, and he gives you life in him. My prayer is that you can rest in that today and know that even amidst the storm, you, you, he knows you, he comes to you, and he calls you to be his own. We serve an incredible God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you that our faith is not what we do, but it's a gift given to us by knowing who you are. As you've revealed yourself to us and you call us to yourself, you allow us to come. Father, give us the ability to just trust increase in us faith, Father. Give us more of it each day. Help us to hear your word, to be in our Bibles, to hear these stories of you coming to people who are imperfect and failing and, and, and allowing them to succeed because of Christ in us. Lord, help us to be encouraged by that, to be built up by it. Lord, help us to see what it means to live and to be like Christ. Teach us to be holy as you are holy, to be set apart Lord, show us what all this means. You need to do it in us. And Lord, thank you that we can trust you that you will. So God, we just thank you that we can have faith in the one who calls us because you are faithful. You are good. You are almighty. You are our king. Help us to remember this today and always. In Jesus' name, amen.